Hi everyone. Today let's spend a few minutes talking about how teaching reading to English learners would be different from teaching native English speakers. Every school district, well really every school, differs in the number of English learners that they serve. Some have almost 100%, some have none, and then there's the gamut in between. English learners do have different and additional needs when learning the English language simultaneously with learning how to read. So look, let's take a few minutes to look at what those needs might be. This is a scale of English language proficiency levels developed by WIDA, which is a consortium of, uh, of 39 states that collaborate and share resources. Minnesota and Wisconsin are both um, members of WIDA. Um, I won't go over all of these, but you can see that it's a scale that starts at entering, and these would be kids who speak really almost no, no English. Um, they could be new to our country. They could be kindergarteners who um, their first exposure to English is going to be at school um, because they speak another language at home. Um, these are, are students who um, basically respond well to pictures, to visual cues. Um, they learn just very, very, sometimes even one word. Um, if they have to go to the bathroom, they might say bathroom. Um, so these are the really, really um, new English speakers. And it goes all the way up to reaching, which is somebody who is... Um, just like a native English speaker. So they have all of the uh, vocabulary that a native English speaker would have. Um, and then the kids that we have in our schools are usually um, anywhere in between, especially at the elementary levels. Let's take just a minute to talk about Bix and Kelp. This was uh, theorized by a researcher named Jim Cummins, and um, Bix stands for Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills. Cap, Kelp, excuse me, stands for Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency. And I think sometimes this is where uh, teachers could get um, the wrong idea about how proficient a student actually is. BIX, those basic interpersonal communi communication skills, they take about one to two years to acquire. And they're very surface level. They're very, it's very social. So talking with their friends, um, their vocabulary is made up of high frequency um, vocabulary. Um, they have very simple sentence structure, but they sound like they know how to speak English. And sometimes we end up expecting more out of them than, than they're actually proficient for. KELP, which is the Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, is really what you need to do school, quote unquote. This takes a lot of experiences, exposure to our culture, um, being able to read a textbook, to know what some of those vocabulary words actually mean, like compare, contrast, analyze. Um, they take five or more years to develop that. Um, they can take up to 10 years or possibly even more. And I like the iceberg analogy because Bix would be on the top, and this is what we see. Um, and what we what hasn't developed yet is what's underneath the iceberg. And um, sometimes I think we make assumptions as teachers that kids are proficient when they really are good at speaking to their friends or to us. Um, as I said, kelp takes much, much longer to learn. And um, so if you think about it, if it takes five to 10 years and we are expecting our students to take our state assessments um, the first year that they are here. So I think that's setting them up for a very, very high pressure situation. Well, what does research say about uh, teaching reading to English, or excuse me, non-English speakers? So if they have good letter recognition, they will be able to learn how to read. They can both develop reading oral proficiency skills simultaneously if they're given a sound instructional program. And this is true for any kind of kiddo that's learning how to read. If you are teaching them well, they will learn. 
Sometimes that does mean not teaching everybody the same way. And English learners have to be able to correctly pronounce English words before they can learn to read. Now, that doesn't mean that, they, that the words that they say are not going to have um, a accent from their, their, their native language, um, but they have to be able to recognize the word and have it be in their vocabulary. Research also tells us that phonemic awareness, just as it is with native English speakers, phonemic awareness is crucial to learn how to read in English. And ELs that don't have a lot of concepts about print in their native language, in other words, do, do these kiddos know how books work? So if you, whether you're a native English speaker or an English learner, if you don't know that a book goes from left to right, that the pictures um, is not where the, the story is. Well, it is, but it isn't. Um, and that we go left side of the book to right side of the book. We do return sweep. If they don't understand those concepts, they are going to have challenges. Um, and that's true of whether you're a native English speaker or an English learner. When you think about it, this is why reading is hard to learn, especially for English learners. How do you teach phonemic awareness and phonics in English to students who can't hear and distinguish sounds? How do you teach fluency to students whose control of the structures of English are still limited? In other words, they may be at um, a level where they're stringing three words together, or they um, have you know, very simple structure that they understand and use, and then we're asking them to read um, structure, English structures that are much more difficult for them. How do you teach grade level vocabulary when they are still at a, at a level where they may not be ready to learn academic vocabulary because they're still learning the vocabulary of home, of school? How do you teach reading comprehension in English when they don't comprehend the English speaking? Well, the predictors of success in learning how to read, whether you're native or uh, English learner, letter recognition, oral language, pronunciation, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, and concept of, about print, being proficient in those are all early predictors of learning how to read. So here are some things to think about with phonemic awareness and ELs. Phonemic awareness is different for them because they may not have enough experience with um, English to disting distinguish the sounds that differ from the sounds in their native language. Um, I think uh, in another video we talked about the fact that um, you know we have 44 phonemes and 26 letters in English and Spanish they actually have and excuse me I was going to say we have 22 vowel sounds as opposed to them having nine. So there are sounds that we say that they do not. So th some things to consider when um, you're talking about teaching phonemic awareness. They can't develop phonological awareness until they're familiar with the sounds of English. Once you start teaching them explicitly, you have to be able to modify um, or sh I should say accommodate, allow for more practice with the sounds especially the ones that can cause confusion to them. Once they have phonological awareness in their native language, that does transfer to other languages. And we tell parents all the time at conferences um, that we encourage them to continue to um, teach their kiddos in their uh, native language or language one because that awareness does transfer between languages. Phonics is different for ELs because they often have difficulty discriminating between similar sounds. And as I was talking about before, English language doesn't have a regular system of sound symbol correspondence. 
So some things to consider when you're teaching phonics. It can be very effective teaching systematic phonics to those at fairly low levels of language proficiency and teach them to learn to decode words. So in other words, um, those kiddos can pick up the basics of um, learning to decode fairly quickly, even if they have a rather low language level. Um, the next one, the most effective reading program for ELs, combines systematic phonics with a print-rich print environment. That really is what's good for everybody, and not just English learners. And many of the components of phonics need to be modified to, to, excuse me, to meet the particular needs of ELs. Um, fluency is different for ELs because they lack proficiency in English. So they are still in the decoding phase, or some of them are. Um, and so that having to think about what the word is and how the word sounds obviously slows down your ability to read smoothly. So thinking about fluency, English learners can't achieve fluency in oral reading before they've achieved fluency in speaking. So when we say, you know, to somebody, um, read like you're talking, well, we want them to have some sentence fluency before we ask them to read sentences fluently. Um, some English learners are self-conscious about their accent and about the errors that they might make. So um, reading aloud in front of the entire class might be um, worrisome to them. Um, just being encouraging, and I always emphasize that I wish I was bilingual. Um, it kind of makes them feel important that they know uh, more languages than the, their teacher does. Um, decoding skills and fluency in oral reading and reading comprehension interact in various ways. So we just have to be patient as they're learning the language, as they're learning vocabulary, as they are um, developing that CALP, that cognitive academic language that will help them comprehend in school. And vocabulary is a huge one. Um, even for very proficient English learners, their knowledge of vocabulary is only a fraction of what it is for English speakers. And if they don't understand even one or two words, they could lose meaning of the passage. So think about the fact that um, once you get up to about third grade, vocabulary carries a lot of the meaning. And if you miss one or two words that you just do not understand, you may lose complete understanding of what the story was about. So we have to be careful about controlling the text that we expose English learners to when we are using them for instruction. Of course, they should be exposed to a wide variety of genres. Obviously, they'll need more explicit vocabulary instruction than um, native English speakers. This is oftentimes where um, ESL services come in. They need instruction in different vocabulary words than their native speakers. Um, there is a researcher, and for some reason I can't think of, oh, Isabel Beck, um, who has kind of tiered vocabulary words. Tier one are kind of like the common um, vocabulary, you know, they, that you use to kind of move around in the world. Desk, car, clock, window, things like that. Tier two words are the words that, that you need that transfer among um, situations, um, among classes, not classes, but um, like you might hear them in history, but you might also hear them in biology. Examples of those words would be things like compare or analyze, things like that, that, that they'll see in a lot of different situations. And then tier three words are kind of the words of um, a particular area. So if you're talking about photosynthesis or you're talking about osmosis, those are vocabulary, tier three vocabulary words because they are specific to like one discipline. So their need for vocabulary teaching techniques and strategies 
is going to be different. You know, beginning ELs are just going to be probably learning those tier one, the, the everyday common words. And uh, many of us are teaching tier two words, which is extremely important because those are the um, cognitive academic ones that will help kids in lots of different subjects. But, you know, English learners are at different rates and levels of language, or excuse me, vocabulary development. And we need to make sure that we're cognizant of that. Having speaking problems today. Comprehension. Reading comprehension is more difficult for English learners than for native because if they have a hard time, first of all, decoding the textbook, but also the content of the textbook. Um, that's where you'll see maybe a lot of those tier three words, the words that are specific to a discipline. Um, do they have phonemic awareness to be able to do that decoding? Do they have sentence fluency that, that they can um, read quickly enough to be able to understand what they're taught, what the uh, book is talking about, and obviously the vocabulary that is used in in for comprehension, they may not be um, aware of those words or their meanings at this point. So some things to consider with comprehension. They might not have the background knowledge necessary for understanding the texts. Um, just keeping that in mind, um, when you give an assessment like the qualitative reading inventory and you ask them some of those um, concept questions, that is probing for background knowledge. And a lot of English learners don't have the same experiences that English speakers have had, and so it might be difficult for them. Um, obviously, we have to think about the level of vocabulary. We might need to do some pre-teaching, um, have word walls, have um, other kinds of visuals. They call that realia. If you have um, like real examples of what some of the vocabulary is. And it needs to be modified. The instruction needs to be modified, not assignments, but the instruction needs to be modified to meet their needs. So let's talk quick about modifications and accommodations for English learners. Modifications change what students are taught and assessed on. Modifications change the rigor. Accommodations change how students are taught. Accommodations allow students ways to access the curriculum. We don't modify curriculum for English learners. We modify assignments and assessments. Okay, so what can you change? You can change, <clears throat> excuse me, the instructional methods and the materials that you use. You can tweak the assignments and the assessments. You shouldn't be changing the rigor, in other words, how hard or difficult it is. But you can um, change the number of questions they have to answer, um, the mode that maybe they answer them in. If they're, they're not proficient in writing yet, maybe they will tell you the answers. You can give them extended time. You can break assignments up into um, smaller chunks. The learning environment. They may be receiving a lot of instruction, especially beginning ELs. Um, they may be receiving a lot of instruction in a separate environment, um, in a small group for ESL services. Um, special communication systems. Um, I guess the biggest example that I can think of there is um, we had a third grade teacher in my school who got a new to country student who spoke not one speck of English. And um, he, or the English, or excuse me, the um, classroom teacher used an iPad with Google Translate. And um, that's kind of how the student was able to communicate um, his wants and needs with the teacher, and um, the teacher was able to explain um, assignments to the student. So accommodations in reading for English learners, obviously lots of explicit instruction, more than English learners will, or excuse me, than English speakers will, on those English phonemes that are not in 
their language one. The biggest example I can think of is BV. Um, the V sound is not present in Spanish. And so a lot of times kids will substitute that with B. So it may, they may say, say something like, I am having a very good time. If students are literate in their native language, focus on differences, that language in English, with less attention given to elements that will transfer. Provide extra practice in reading, words, sentences, and stories. Use cognates in their native language. Cognates are words that can you could trace back to a similar root, like a Latin root. Like um, music, for instance. In English, it's music. In Spanish, it's musical. Um, television, television. Um, I do not speak Spanish, so pardon my uh, pronunciations there. But cognates are very important because they are a link between language one and language two. Those are, are easy ways to start to understand what a word is, uh, what a word means, excuse me. So think about when we do um, spelling for meaning. We do that morpholo morphological analysis. That's kind of what you're doing with those cognates. You're looking at commonalities between English and the other language. Make sure that you identify and clarify different words and passages. Um, I know with our elementary students, we have to really make sure that we pre-read some things that we're going to assign them to make sure that there are not sentence structures that we think that they would have a lot of trouble with. Okay, summarizing, teaching them to summarize, summarizing for them when they're first learning out, really important. And then encourage ways that they are able to use their native language because we don't want them to lose it. I've had students who, by the time they're in fifth grade, don't speak or understand their native language very well um, They because they have been kind of immersed in English. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it, it's a shame because somebody who is bilingual, I think, will, do, um, will be at an advantage as they go through school and life. So this was kind of a little whirlwind uh, tour of uh, teaching English learners, and I guess we'll see you next time.